Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the first seminar of 2023. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, I'm pleased to introduce Luke Zoot, right? Yeah, getting it right. Um, it's been super fun to have Luke. He came earlier than I anticipated. And so we spent a lot of time yesterday chatting and it was super fun. Luke has a really amazing backstory of um, just he got these degrees in different places. So he went to Michigan for his undergrad, Michigan State, Michigan State yeah. and then Penn State, where he interacted with a number of people in the audience um, during his PhD with Sridhar Nandakrishnan and, and Richard Alley, uh, working on seismicity of ice and sediments and stuff. And then he ended up going to work with Neil Iverson at Iowa State, yeah. um, using a ring shear device to shear sediments and understand the rheology of sediments. Uh, he went, then got a, a employed at Wisconsin, brought a ring shear, built his own ring shear device there. And then he's had a like explosion of all these different topics that he's been working on. Um, I just wanted to note a couple of his <clears throat> most recent proposals because there's like a frez in here looking at um, Lake Superior Basin natural geomorphic experiment. Um, there's solar system ice, uh, there's wave erosion on ice cliffs, a NOAA Sea Grant for looking at bluffs, beaches, and bars in Lake Michigan, Antarctic glaciology, uh, estimating subglacial effective pressure with acoustic or with uh, active seismics, um, freeze on of subglacial sediments, experiments in theory. Like, there's so many different topics here. I don't know how he does it. He has seven PhD students. I'm like amazed by you. And he just got the early career award at AGU last fall. So I feel like we're really lucky to have him before he becomes like crazy famous. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please help me in welcoming Luke uh, to give the seminar today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm just easily distracted, which is, which is why everything's all over the place. But um, yeah, uh, you know, it's been great being here, seeing, you know, lots of familiar faces. Uh, I thought I'd uh, talk about uh, one, just one area of that work that um, I thought would be, you know, interesting to people in this, in this community because of some of the problems they're working on, which is specifically this question of like how glaciers are able to move around sediment and build landforms, which seems like a very simple question, right? Like we're in Texas, but you know, in, in the Northern part of the country, the whole landscape is just dictated by how glaciers move sediment around and built up landforms. And that's where we live. Everything we do, everything we live on is influenced by uh, this very, you know, fairly simply sounding process of like what glaciers did to the landscape. Although it seems simple, it, there's sort of this gulf between being able to mechanically predict how glaciers move sediment around and being able to go in the field and look at things. There's just this, there's a separation between the two. And so with this project, me and uh, my former uh, PhD student, Dula Hansen, who's now current postdoc, uh, try to investigate this problem in a systematic way by uh, using some experimentation. And so this, this uh, picture here, is one uh, that I took out of a helicopter in Iceland. And what you're seeing at the top left of the photo is a glacier. And then in the bottom portion of the, of the image are these big mounds of dirt right here. And then this is like a dirty lake, a proglacial lake. And this glacier has overridden these, uh, these piles of dirt. And over time, as it's flowed, it sort of moved them around and shaped them into these big mounds. And they're called drumlins. Uh, this is the world's only active drumlin field, meaning that the glacier is still advancing and retreating over it. But we have these all over Wisconsin, all over Minnesota, the upper Midwest. They're in many places our sole source of topography. So uh, we care greatly about, uh, about their presence, if nothing else, if, if we don't care about how they're made. Um, okay. I guess I'll use this. All right, so just to put it in context, this is a map of Antarctica and it's color coded by the velocity with which the ice is moving at the surface. And the, the purpler colors are moving fast and the greener sort of light red colors moving slow. And it's a logarithmic uh, velocity scale. And you can see there's certain areas like um, right here that are moving particularly fast. Whereas 
large parts of the interior are moving pretty slow. And when you look at a glacier, instead of from the surface, if you were to look at it at a side cut and try to attribute the different components that give rise to that motion that you're seeing at the surface, um, you, you would see it is broken up into different parts. And so here's just a time-lapse video of the surface that's showing a glacier in Asia that's moving over lots of time. And so just to give you context, the glaciers flow just like rivers, but on you know much longer time scales. And so when people started to work on this, some of the original work was by this guy, John Nye in the fifties. And this is a glacier from the side. And so uh, up here, you have the surface of the glacier where you would stand. And this is the bed of the glacier down here where it's sitting on uh, the underlying rock. And this vertical line here is basically a borehole that you would drill. And if you came back some time later, what you would see is that borehole is deflected slightly. And that deflection is because the ice is deforming in response to the deviatoric stress that's imposed on it by the surface slope. But the bulk of the motion at the surface isn't made up by the deformation of the ice. Instead, it's, it's arising from this big discontinuity that you can see at the bottom here where the ice is slipping over the bed. And so people a lot of times use an analog of, of a glacier flow is like pouring honey on a board and tipping the board but a closer analogy is more like putting an ice cube on a board and tipping the board. And the ice cube might deform a little bit, but it's mostly just sliding over the board, right? And so that physics of what's happening right where that ice cube is sitting on the board is giving rise to what's holding the ice back. It's giving rise to uh, what's how the bed is deforming, if the bed is made up of a grain of the material, and how those landforms that uh, I showed are being built. And so what Nye didn't realize in the 50s, but we've since come to learn with people like Don Blankenship and work they've done uh, when they were at Wisconsin, eh, is that the bed of lots of these fast moving glaciers are made up of deformable material. And that a large portion of the forward motion of the glacier is not actually accommodated necessarily by the ice sliding over a rigid material, but is through the actual deformation of that granular material of that sediment that's sitting at the bed. Uh, so just to sort of zoom in at the bed, you might find something like this. So you have ice at the top here, sitting atop a deformable bed material like till. There's could be a small component of sliding that's giving rise to it. And there can be some zone down to some depth where that till is deforming. And so if we wanna know how those landforms are made, if we wanna know how glaciers are shaping their bed, we need to know the shape of that curve of how this thing is deforming the till, what, what's dictating the depth it's going, what's dictating the, the sort of the Y component, this accelerometer is really tricky, but uh, what's the form, what's, what's, it's giving rise to the X component of it. And so we need to be able to describe this in sort of mathematical terms, like what, what is the leading order control on the, on the advection or the flux of that granular material in this zone that's being deformed. Uh, I thought I'd just start out by showing a bunch of pictures, right? So this talk's got a lot of introduction to sort of set the stage because it's kind of interesting, right? We're in uh, choice of landforms and stuff like this. So this is a bed of a glacier. This is just a little tunnel that was carved out by a stream that you can walk up into. And you can see all this basal till and the ice sitting on top of it. So that ice is moving and it's deforming that basal till layer. Uh, here's just another shot of some basal till at the iceberg interface. And it has that nice lineations in it. And those lineations sometimes can form from a granular material being highly deformed. They sort of preserve this fissile texture to them. Uh, other places that have deformable tills at their base are these fast moving glaciers in Antarctica, like I said. And so this is an active source uh, seismic study by Atsumuto, uh, where he lights off explosive at the surface, the energy goes down, bounces off the bed and comes back up, and they can build a picture of what the bed looks like. But if they use more sophisticated techniques by spacing out the receivers and looking at the angles, they can tell what the bed is made up of. And so that orange line there represents the bed that they picked and that gray color bar on the bottom that's gray and white represents that the bed is made up of soft material. And then this vernacular soft uh, means deformable, which means it's made up of sediment or till or something like that. Where, we, where I live in Madison, which is uh, in the middle of Wisconsin, basically, uh, is, is, is completely comprised by these basal tills. And so this is a glacial geologic map of the upper Midwest. Everything that has a color on here uh, is something that was uh, deposited or affected by a glacier. So basically the whole thing. And everywhere it's green are these basal till units. And so you have these big lobes of the Laurentide that are forming here and here 
Madison sort of in this area. Uh, and these are all sort of deposited and overridden by the glaciers slowly advancing out of Canada, chewing up the bedrock or overriding material that was already there and slowly evecting it or fluxing it uh, to the south with time. There's lots of these landforms that are left behind that are formed by the advection or flux of this till. I'll just talk about a couple of these that are kind of interesting. Drumlins, which are probably the one that most people have heard of. Uh, they're sort of the most prominent geologic feature in Wisconsin is that we have this huge drumlin field all over the place. Drumlins are these elongated bed forms that are elongated in the direction of flow. And you can see that there's an elevation relief between the surface of this and the surrounding area. And the reason that that's occurred is because till has been advected out of a certain area and piled up in another area. And then the ice, as it's flowing around these, has streamlined these and progressively changed their shape. And this map over here on the right is sort of the area of Wisconsin uh, around Madison. So Madison's located right here between these two lakes. Uh, all of those linear features you can see are there are thousands and thousands of drumlins. So there's 15,000 of them that we've mapped and built sort of numerical models to predict how they form and what causes their elongation. Uh, but at the heart, the heart of it is this idea that the glacier is advecting this till differentially. In some places it's doing it and lowering the size, and in some places it's doing it and raising the center of these drumlins. Uh, here's a radar survey we did through some drumlins in Iceland, and we could look at the internal stratigraphy and look at how the till was stacked up over time and begin to sort of piece together how they were made. And in this case, they have this sort of stratigraphy where there's erosion on the heads of them, and material that's eroded on the heads is then deposited on the leaf, and they progressively elongate over time. Flutes are sort of these other elongated features. So these sort of stripes that you can see in this image here, that are uh, these long features here, they have boulders at their head, and then these extremely long linear features that form behind them. And the idea is that the till is, is basically being fluxed into a cavity that opens up behind a boulder that's lodged at the bed. So the ice is flowing around a boulder and it makes a gap and the ice is also as it's flowing, moving the till, and it's piling it into that area behind the boulder. And it builds these super long linear features over time. Uh, moraines. Uh, this is an active source seismic survey we did from a boat in Lake Superior. And we could look through some of these big, um, these big till features and look at these huge moraines that were connecting Isle Royal National Park to the Keweenaw Peninsula, these things and sort of look at their internal stratigraphy and again, see how the material was deposited on top of each other uh, over time. And begin to sort of try to understand how the Lake Superior lobe carved the basin, retreated over time and affected the geomorphology of the upper Midwest. Uh, but these aren't just in the Lake Superior lobe. This is from West Antarctica. These are these quote unquote grounding zone wedges, which are in some ways very similar to the moraines I was showing that are building up in these sequential patterns as till is being advected by the ice and piled up over, over time, over time, over time. Uh, Megascale glacial delineations. This is sort of like flutes, but on a much different scale. So this scale bar is 10 kilometers. So these things are prevalent around Canada. And the idea is that basically ice has deformed the sediment, the underlying sediment, and formed these long linear features that, are, that stretch across huge spanses of Canada around Hudson Bay in particular. Uh, but they are also viewed or imaged underneath West Antarctica using radars as well. And they can sort of, in some instances, they've seen them actively being formed as the till has been deformed. Uh, why is this important from a glaciological perspective? Is that the glacier's ability to move till uh, will dictate if it actually can move all of the till out of an area and get down to the underlying bedrock. Right. So if you imagine a glacier bed, you might have some areas that are covered with this granular material. But you might have other areas that are this rigid bedrock. Right. And NSF has spent millions of dollars sending people to Antarctica with radars and seismic data to try to figure out this spatial extent because it's extremely important for how glaciers will flow. Right. Whether they're flowing over bedrock or till has different mechanical responses at the iceberg interface. And so we're trying to map out where those are. Uh, this is an active source seismic survey that shows Thwaites Glacier, and it's a flow line of it. And again, Atsu's broken it up into soft beds. 
So areas like this and hard beds that correspond with the image above. And so you can have in some areas, this checkerboard pattern of soft beds and hard beds. And the reason that's occurring is because when you have a soft bed, you've evicted more till into that area than you could evict out of it. And in areas where you have a hard bed, you've evicted more till out of that area than you've evicted into it. And so over time, that's that this till evection or the ability for till, the glacier to move the till is what sets the, the placement of hard and soft beds at the beds of glaciers, which ultimately dictates uh, uh, how fast they move. Okay, so why is this important? Because it builds lots of glacial landforms. If you live in Wisconsin, you really care about that. It controls if the beds of glaciers will be covered with till, soft, or will be exposed hard rock. If you live in Florida, you really care about that, right? So whether the bed is hard or soft has big implications on these glacier slip dynamics. Uh, but fundamentally, we have to be able to predict is till being evicted into an area or out of an area faster, which ultimately means we have to have some ability to predict how much till the glacier is evicted, how deep this profile is, and how fast it scales. And so there's a couple leading order hypotheses that people have proposed for what controls it, the sliding speed of the glacier, the granularity of the till, meaning the makeup of the granular material, and something called the effective pressure, which is simply the weight of the ice minus the water pressure at the, at the bed of the glacier or something else. So sliding speed of the glacier. So here's an idea that uh, some physical geographers put forward that you know these shapes of these bed forms, these drum, drum ones in this case are highly dictated by the speed of the overriding ice. So here's 600 meters a year, 150, 50. If they're 600 meters a year, they're really long and skinny. Uh, again, this is, this is just basically um, a conceptual argument. And these are different examples that they've gone to look at. But people have used that conceptual argument to go to the Laurentide and look for those elongated bed forms and then say, there's really elongated bed forms here. The ice has been going really fast. There's really slow, uh, really short bed forms here. The ice must have been going really slow. And that's how they've reconstructed where the ice was going fast and slow that they've used to basically parameterize numerical models of how the Laurentide ice sheet behaved in the past. But this is fundamentally pinned on this idea that the flow speed is dictating the till flux per, uh, linearly or proportionally, which is then dictating the degree of al alignment of those bed forms. The problem is till is a cooling material, it's a granular material, right? Cooling materials have no reason to have a strain rate dependence on stress. Therefore, they have no necessary reason to have a till flux that's dependent on flow speed or stress, right? We know unquestionably that till is a cooling material. It gets more complicated because this cooling material is coupled to a viscous material. And so those two things combined may interact in a way that maybe we didn't hypothesize. Granularity of the till is an is a interesting feature, you can have different sized grains and that can, uh, can affect that coupling at the ice bed interface. It can also affect uh, the deformation that occurs within the zone of till that's deforming. Uh, maybe have class, this is a model by Slavic Tulicek that sort of predicts how these different granularities will affect coupling at the ice bed interface and then ultimately deliver stress to the underlying till. Effective pressure is another one which again is the weight of the ice minus the water pressure that's at the bed of a glacier. And we have uh, some models that say, as the effective pressure increases, that depth of the deforming zone will go up. Uh, like in this, more effective pressure has wider deformation, that if the, if the weight of the glacier pressing down on the underlying till goes up, the zone of the deforming zone will increase, the, the width of the deforming zone will increase. Whereas we have other models that say the exact opposite, right? That as the effective pressure goes up, the zone of the deforming zone will go down. This is what civil engineers tend to say. This is what glaciologists tend to say. They're at exact odds with each other. Why? Don't know, because we don't have a good mechanical understanding of what's going on, right? Okay, what does the shape of it look like? Does it look like this concave profile? Does it look like something that's focused right at the ice interface? Does it look like something that's... Uh, basically moving as a plug, but there's a, a decomont at depth. And so something like this, pervasive deformation that goes deep, 
a thin zone of deformation that's focused at the ice interface, or maybe a thin zone of deformation, but that's not focused at the ice interface, all possible options. People have tried to figure this out in a multitude of ways. Uh, one way is they drilled holes to the beds of glaciers and jammed tools down there to try to measure it. Uh, something like this, so this is a hole through the ice, and these are these stakes that go into the actual till, and then they wait and they look at how the stakes move to try to figure this problem out. So this is Engelhart and Cam drilling through these places in Antarctica and measuring how the stakes move to get a sense of how the shear is distributed in that deforming zone. And what Cam found is that on Willens Ice Stream, fairly close to each other, you get areas where you have a thin zone of deformation focused right near the expert interface, and not too far away, you have a thin zone of deformation focused at some depth. So the field, even at a fairly close field spot, you're getting somewhat different answers here, right? Uh, this sort of uh, classic study by Blankenship et al. in the 80s, where they use active source seismics to infer what the ice bed interface was made up of and how thick that deforming is. First, they figured out that there was till there. And then second, that they inferred that the zone of deformation was, was quite thick, right? And so there, this was a companion set of papers in nature at the time, but that the zone of deformation of the till is something like five meters thick. So uh, a huge zone of till is being deformed by this overriding ice over time. In direct, that's in contrast with the studies that Cam just showed, all the same place, okay? Kind of a more interesting study in some ways is this site in Norway where you can get under the glacier and they, they blasted a trench out and they filled it up with till. That's what this is. And they put all these sensors in here to measure basically how the till would deform. And in doing so, they could measure what the deformation looked like in the till over time. And they find that the deformation is focused in a fairly narrow zone, sort of like 10 centimeters, more like what Cam saw in Antarctica, right near the ice foot interface. Furthermore, sedimentologists, glacial geologists have been looking at these things in the field for a long time, right? And when they go out and they look at these sedimentological structures, and they see this nicely preserved uh, bedding features, that indicates that there hasn't been pervasive deformation in this. Even though this was being overridden by the glacier, this would be all mixed up, right? And so the glacial geologists have been fighting with the glaciologists and the glaciologists have been fighting with each other, basically, okay? You see these types of features that are preserved that also would have been destroyed if, uh, if the um, till had pervasively deformed that as it was overriding. You're not intended to read this. This is a, <laughs> this is a chart out of a book that lists all a bunch of studies that are looking at this and they're all saying completely different things about the effects of the effective pressure, the granularity, the sliding speed, whether that's making the zone of deforming wider, narrow, elongating it or, or shortening, right? So takeaways on till deformation. One, it's important for many aspects of glaciology and glacial geology. And two, nobody can agree on a damn thing, right? <laughs> right? They're all over the place, right? They can't determine what's controlling what because they can only see a snapshot of the picture in the field, right? So in the field, many factors are changing, rendering it difficult to identify which factors are controlling the deformation or observe the complete picture, right? With these ancient tills, the stuff that's preserved in the geologic record, you get a much better spatial picture of what's going on, but you can't directly relate what you're seeing to the, the proper dynamics for, you know, stresses types of things uh, that are occurring in the glacial system. So what our objective was with this study was to determine how subglacial control, things like sliding velocity, granularity of the tail, effective pressure, et cetera, influence that distribution of strain and sediment flux, right? Can we, can we figure out why no one has been able to agree on anything and figure out what sort of these leading order controls are? And so to address this, we'll go to the lab, right? So we built this machine at UW-Madison. It's what's called a large diameter cryogenic ring shear. The whole thing sits in a freezer and the sample chamber, this part right here, is uh, about, about a meter in diameter. Uh, the sample chamber is basically pressed from the bottom to simulate the effective stress at the bottom of a glacier. We can control the pore water pressure in it. It's, it's held rotationally fixed, whereas a ring of ice that's on the top, that's placed atop the sediment, is gripping the upper surface of the ice and rotating it. 
and the bottom isn't allowed to rotate. And so we basically force deformation in the system, just like would occur at the bottom of a glacier. And we can measure the resistance, we can measure the effect of stress, we can measure the water pressure. Um, the sample chamber is transparent. So we can look into it while this thing is going on. And then the sample chamber sits inside a giant tub of transparent antifreeze. And the antifreeze is used to regulate the temperature of the ice to within about a hundredth of a degree and keep it right at the pressure melting point. Because to get the physics right, we need the ice to be at its homologous temperature, right at the pressure melting point, because that's what happens at the base of fast moving glaciers. And then we spin the thing over a range of speeds that are representative of glacial speeds. And we squeeze it with a range of effective stressors like stress that exactly replicate the effective stresses that you would find in glacier in its glacial base. So there's, unlike a lot of other laboratory experiments, there's basically no scaling that's needed with this particular problem. It's almost directly applicable to field situations. Um, okay, so this is just a schematic of it. We can roll the sample chamber out, we can put it in, it's, it's in this clay coal bath. Um, it's got a huge gearbox. It's got about two million to one ratio because we generate these absolutely massive torques uh, to spin over a sample that big that those two giant metal I-beams on either side actually flex in response to it. Um, and it's got a- Sorry, could you say that again? No, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> sure he's got a question. And it's got this tiny little motor that's connected to this giant gearbox. It's basically a gearbox from like a Caterpillar tractor that we used to drive it. Importantly, because the sample chamber is clear and we can see in it, we put cameras in there. And these are sort of high resolution microscope cameras that we can track the individual grains and figure out how the grains are moving from one minute to the next effectively using digital image uh, cross-correlation techniques. Are you simulating the sediment or are you using real sediment? We're using real glacial sediment right there. So it's a 12, 12 centimeter layer of horicon till which is the glacial till that's in Wisconsin. It's the one that's in Madison. It's the one that I've run all experiments on for the most part. Although I have tills from Willens and other places, Thwaites that we're gonna put in there eventually. Uh, the temperature is maintained within a hundredth of the pressure melting point. We step through this range of sliding speeds. It's fairly representative of real glaciers. We can go faster, we can go slower if we want. And we go to effective pressures that are as low as eight kilopascals up to uh, 200. And anarch ice streams are maybe around 25. It turns out not to be hard to do the high end. It's hard to do the low end. It's hard to have pumps hold the pressure that you need to get down to these low ends of effective pressures, but, but our values that are representative of what you actually find at the base of Antarctic glaciers. Uh, the till is has this uh, a granular, this is the grain size distribution plot of it. It's a typical till with a fractal distribution. Tills typically evolved to some sort of something that looks kind of fractal in nature. Uh, this is putting the till in there, and then we basically level it out, do a little bit of pre-consolidation. Uh, we don't consolidate it more than our minimum effective stress, but just to re reduce the initial uh, consolidation that happens when we put the load on the system. Uh, we put these vertical strings of beads in there that you can see on the right. These get frozen into the ice, but there's also some in the till. They serve as passive indicators of the strain, the overall strain of the experiment that we can use to check and make sure our cameras are doing a good job. Uh, we build this ice ring atop it. We take deionized water, we crush it, we put it in there, and then we flood the deionized water because we don't want the ice to have uh, a preferred fabric that will influence the, the rheology of the ice. We want one to be able to develop naturally. Uh, we, this is the sample chamber can be slid out of the load frame and we slide it into the load frame. Um, and we pour a little layer of liquid water on the top. And we couple the upper platen to it. And those big teeth get frozen into the top. Those teeth are made out of a special material called delrin, which has a low thermal conductivity, which inhibits this thing called regulation uh, that we don't want to occur at the upper boundary. And once it's frozen in, we, we turn the temperature of the room down to like negative five. We freeze it in. Then we raise the whole thing up and we thaw everything out and get it to the ice to the pressure melting point. All the while we've been doing complicated things to keep the till water saturated, completely water saturated, but not frozen. Um, and this is a time lapse of what's happening, right? So this is sped up 3000 fold. You can see the ice ring moving by. You can see um, this zone of tills being deformed here. There's a little bit of till that's being deformed down at depth, but 
not moving nearly as much as what's happening at the ice bed interface. Uh, here's just a, another picture of the schematic of what's going on. Uh, we can measure things, like I said, this, this isn't the focus of this talk, but we can measure the stresses and the resistive forces. So that on the top plot, it's a time series. The uh, black line is the pressure of the ice, the, the load we impose. The blue line is the water pressure. We subtract those two to get the effective pressure. Most glaciological things are termed in, are framed in terms of this effective pressure. And then we can measure that red line, which is the resultant torque by literally measuring the flexure of the whole metal frame of the system and calibrating that against known torques. Uh, and then we can, from these two, we can get a friction value and how it's varying in time. Uh, when we're done, we dig it up and we can dig out the beads and we see sort of interesting patterns. I don't know if you can see this here, but the top of this is kind of like darker in color and the bottom isn't. And that's because this top part has been highly deformed and little pockets of dark material that we put in there got mixed into the rest of the system and changed its color. And on the bottom, uh, that didn't happen. And so you have these highly strained zones up here that are dark in color and these non-highly strained zones down here that are not dark in color. This is a view from these uh, microscope cameras that are showing this deformation. So we have the ice at the top moving from left to right. And then we have this zone in, below it that's deforming. And then if you watch it for a long enough period of time, you can see some amount of uh, deformation occurring deeper within the sediment column too. And this, what's occurring at the wall is matching what's occurring on the interior. And we know that because we have those bead strings placed in the interior and the friction coefficient on the walls is, is is smaller than the friction coefficient between the sediment two. And so we do this digital image correlation technique where we chop the one image up into thousands of parts and another image up into thousands of parts and we move them around and we try to spatially correlate them. And then based off far they go from one image to the next, the images are separate, separated by um, one minute in time, we can get the two dimensional offset magnitude of the, of the individual parts that we cross correlated. And from that, we can get the displacement vectors to, to trace um, how far it's moved. It's sort of like speckle tracking or things like that, remote sensing. So this is just sort of an image of it in real time. And we do this for a while. And then we integrate all those displacement vectors at one velocity and effective stress combination and get the profile of how the deformation looks. And then we change either the velocity or the effective stress. And we do it again, we do it again, and we do it again. We can systematically step through all of these properties that uh, people have been guessing that control the, the di distribution of strain in the till. And so one, one profile might look like this. So zero on the top is the ice bed interface. And this is X centimeters into the till. And the deformation goes from a lot to a little as you get deeper and deeper in the till. Uh, first, we'll talk about the shear zone. This is the thing that most people have focused on in those studies in particular. Uh, one thing, when we look at the control as a function of the grain size, if we take the thickness of the shear band, that's what this T sub B is, and normalize it by the grain D50 grain size, so the average grain size, over a range of effective stresses, we see that they sort of plot in between this value of 10 and 30, meaning that the zone of that deforming band is 10 to 30 times the, the average grain size dimension. And that's sort of consistent over a range of effective stress. Uh, that is that 10 to 30 is sort of consistent with other uh, civil engineering studies that have used discrete element method models to look at the same types of things. So yes, there's a grain size dependence on the thickness of the shear zone. The effective pressure. So this is a series of those curves as we, at one sliding velocity, as we step up the effective pressure from eight to 22, to 50, to 130, to 190 kilopascals. So you can think of this as the glacier putting more and more weight on the granular skeleton of the sediment. And what you see is that the thickness of the deforming zone is initially small, it gets a little bigger, then it gets even bigger, but then something interesting happens and it starts to get smaller and smaller again, right? There's a non-monotonic response in how the thickness of the deforming zone responds to effective stress in that it doesn't just always increase or always decrease, it goes up for a while, and then it goes down. And we've done this at multiple velocities, and now we've done it by cyclically oscillating the effective stress, and we've found the same response every time. And so this is the, just the normalized sediment flux on the y-axis and that effective stress on the x-axis. And you see that it basically goes up, and then it comes back down, right? 
And this explains a lot of the ambiguity that people are seeing in the field, right? Some people are probably looking at this part of the curve and saying as effective stress goes up, that zone was thickening in their field situation. And other people were looking at this part of the curve, right? So the civil engineers were right and the glaciologists were right. They just didn't know how to put it together, essentially, right? But there's this important stress at which the inflection point uh, changes from an increasing deforming zone to a decreasing deforming zone. What's, what's causing it? Well, it has to do what we think with force chains that develop in the deforming zone. So when you deform a granular material, most of the grains aren't doing anything. There's a subset of the grains that are carrying the load from where the force is being imparted as it's being resisted. And this is a set of these examples from this, these photoelastic discs where the, uh, Karen Daniels is rotating this ring and you can see the disc lighting up. That's an actual experiment on the right. It's not a model. And the disc light up when they're carrying the actual force from the inside spinning drum to the outer wall, that's rotationally fixed. And so that's sort of like what's occurring in this deforming zone. The ice is moving, imparting the stress. The stress is being transferred through some of the grains through the deforming zone over time. And you can see this sort of lit up here. It looks like lightning. That's the, those are the grains that are actually carrying the load. And so what's happening? So force chains develop within the shear band. The force chains develop through grain sliding and rotating. So there's basically two ways the grains can get by each other. It's like your knuckles, if you put them together and you slide them past each other, one is they can move up and over, they can slide past each other. The other is they can sort of rotate by each other, right? And the force, as the effective stress increases and you start to decrease the void space, you start to press the grains closer and closer together. Uh, basically, as the void ratio decreases, the rotation decreases because there's more points of contact between individual grains. So it becomes harder and harder for them to rotate and they're limited to this sliding process, right? Initially, this reduction in the rotation causes the shear zone to thicken, but then past a certain point and rotation really gets shut off or heavily decreased and rotation stops, then it starts to consolidate or localize this train. And most things in nature operate only on that decreasing side because the effective stresses are very rarely this low. The glacial system is kind of unique that you can be at such low effective stresses that you could potentially have to worry about this other part of the problem, right? So past that inflection end value, further increases in the points of uh, contact shut down uh, the rotations, and then that starts narrowing the shear band. If we look at the control on velocity, and remember there's no reason the till flux has to scale with velocity because the till is a cool material, but it's coupled with a viscous ice top it. However, we see that as the velocity goes up on the x-axis, the sediment flux also goes up on the y-axis, and it goes up in a nearly linear way. We see that the same linear trend uh, from the points we have at all effective stresses. And so that assumption that people have been making for a long time, even though it didn't prior to this have any real mechanical basis or it was empirically validated, actually is, is right, right? It's the, it, it was a correct assumption. And so we see this again at higher effective stresses. We have less data points at these. Now we have a lot more, but this is just from a paper we had that came out, I guess, less last year now. Uh, so the effective pressure and granularity set the thickness of the zone and the overall till flux is a function of the thickness of the deforming zone and then the actual forward motion of the glacier, right? So we have this one other component that I'll talk a little bit about quickly, which is sometimes we see this plug of sediment moving at the top. It's all moving at the same speed. And this sort of puzzled us for a while. Uh, but when we looked at the cameras, we could see that the ice sometimes went from a level that was high, like in one, to lower, and then high. And the cameras are at the same spot. And so what that means is that the ice is basically lowering and then rising. And so the ice bed in the ring shear, especially at the ends of the experiments, isn't completely flat. It basically has a structure to it, a morphology. And that morphology sometimes is called a keel, like a keel on a sailboat. And as it's pushed through there, it basically acts like a bulldozer and it pushes everything in front of it ahead at sort of a uniform rate because that keel of ice is being pushed through the system. And so the conceptual model is something like this, that the sediment flux in the plug is a function of the amplitude of the keel. So how thick the keel can stick down into the ice and the degree of coupling at the ice bed interface. Whereas in the shear zone in particular, the sediment flux in the shear zone depends on the velocity of the ice and the effective pressure and somewhat on the grain size distribution. 
And so when we think of this possible pattern of deformation that's occurring rapidly, it's it's thin thin zone of deformation that sometimes can be situated near the ice bit interface, sometimes deeper down, especially if there's a keel that's driving it deeper down. And so the granularity of the till, yes, the D50 influences the shear, that shear zone thickness, the effective pressure, yes, but in this double valued way, sliding speed, yes, nearly linearly, which is great, it makes modeling it much easier. Something else, uh, well, these are quantitative findings that we can parameterize, and now we've started to put them in ice sheet models to move sediment around, be able to predict how things under Antarctica will build landforms or not, basically, now that we know how to parameterize things because we know the physical processes. Uh, yeah, the basal ice morphology seems to be important too. You have these big keels, you have these lots of bulldozers at the ice foot interface, basically. So when we go back to Cam's findings, and he had this thin zone and this thick zone, probably what he really had was a keel hanging out, and he happened to put his tilt meter in front of it. And it was that's why it was basically focusing the locus of deformation at depth as opposed to what's right at the edge of the place. And so some takeaways is these findings provide a way to unify all those different observations. They kind of in some way can explain all the ambiguity that was from all the different field observations. Uh, the deformation is essentially broken down into two parts, that shear zone that, again, depends on the effective pressure and granularity and uh, the plug flow if the bed, if the bed is irregular, uh, and it depends on ice morphology, ice bed morphology. And the sediment flux depends on the deformation profile, number one, and the flow speed of the glacier. And those two things give rise to the overall flux of till into or out of an area. Uh, this is some of my group, uh, Glacier in Alaska. This guy right here, not the guy wearing the Texas hat, but the guy right next to him is the one that, that did all this work, this work. This guy was one of my PhD students, but he came from your department. So this, actually this picture got me in a bunch of trouble because I put it on the cover of our alumni magazine. And they're like, why is someone wearing a Texas? Oh God, yeah. So, Everybody's smiling because yeah. the guy that did the work. <laughs> yeah, that's his MO, yeah. So that's it. Uh, if, I, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them, yeah. Okay. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the, you started out flat, right? Yeah. So uh, do you understand why those keels form and what controls where they form? Yeah. Okay. So all the experiments I showed with, that we were systematically testing the velocity and the effective stress, uh, we, those were flat the whole time. The first time we made the experiment, we did a bad job and made a keel which turned out to be interesting because it allowed us to look at that keel dynamics. But it, it does turn out that in some of the experiments, after we're done collecting experiments, sometimes I just have them run it for a long time to see what happens. And we get keels that form. And it probably, what I think it has to do with is the heat that's generated at the ice bed interface from the friction is just a function of the, uh, the velocity times the, the basal drag. And if that's varying spatially a little bit, you can basically start a feedback to partially erode the ice in one place where the heat generation is a little higher, and that can cause a little bit of a feedback that starts to develop keels. Yeah. And some kind of instability. Yeah. That okay. maybe do with the size of the chunks and stuff. And yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Um, really cool talk, Luke. Uh, Two related questions, I guess, about the the till deformation at the bed. One is, do you see anything that that changes systematically over the course of an experiment that might, you know, I, I think thinking about like in rock mechanics fault zone experiments, we typically see as shears as shear fabric develops, you might see a, a, a something superimposed on on the short time scale stuff that is like a a long term slip weakening related to the fact that you've developed a fabric and you might imagine under a real glacier that that might happen. Um, and then sort of semi-related question, um, your effective pressures, is that through the entire till or are you localizing that to be like a high pore pressure and weak just uh, interface at the till ice interface? Yeah, good good questions. The first question, the deformation of the, of the till and does a fabric develop? Yes, we just had a paper accepted this week that explores that. and 
the thing that happens is the strain in this till is so high. It, you know, it's like 5,000 or something, right? And so by the time you reach a strain of 10, you've already set those fabrics in place. And so we get those fabrics and they're affluence, but they're already in there. And we, we have this run up period where when we change the properties, there's some transient that occurs be, but until we get to the next steady state. And part of that transient is the redevelopment of a new fabric that's uh, appropriate for those stress and velocity conditions. And so they happen, they're in there. When we're talking about this, it's just steady state and we've skipped over those effects, but we're now looking at those effects. Your second question was, is the, is the uh, pore pressure, is the effective stress equal through the hotel column? No, because for one, there's the weight of the till as you get deeper into the, into the sediment, which is not a lot in this case, but is some. The other is that the source of the water, just like in the real environment, is, is largely coming from melting at the ice spread interface. And so that has to flow through the till. And so that creates a higher water pressure, most likely, at the ice bed interface than it would down in the till because the water pressure has to basically build up near the ice bed interface where the source of the water is, set up the pressure gradient that drives it through Darcy and flow through the till. And so we measure the water pressure in a bunch of different locations to figure that out. So, is, so just to follow up, so the measured water pressure is high it, it is highest at the till ice interface and then below that is somehow Decreasing, uh, decreasing yeah. continuously. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, most of our measured water pressure sensors are focused near that interface, but then we put some of them farther away. And we've done that. What what we've done now is because you know a lots of glaciers like the work that Jenny's done, like they don't the effective pressure is not the same, right? They get melted at the surface and it goes down the bed and it pressurizes it, and so the effective pressure is moving through the day, essentially in response to the surface water input. And so the last round of experiments we've done is with this with this RAM, it's the same RAM you have, or it's the same pump you have, we can basically put in a prescribed function and we cyclically oscillate the effective stress as we're shearing and allow all those systems to evolve. And we look at the deformation, but we also look at the resultant resistance, uh, drag resistance the bed provides to understand if there's basically a driving of consolidated till down into the... Uh, down into the till column from his work that Damien did with one of his grad students actually. Yep, yeah. More fun to throw this long distance. Um, thank you for your talk, really cool. Um, I was wondering, might be a silly question, but is there a cycle of hard beds becoming soft again? I know you like introduced like certain sections within like seismic graphs, like here's hard, here's soft. And I'm wondering if there's like a cycle of that and what kind of time scale that would occur on. Oh, that's a good question. So the time scale that would occur on is basically because it turn from the stuff we've done, you don't need a really thick zone of soft beds to the actual bed mechanically behaving soft. If you can get 15 centimeters or a half a meter of till on top of a hard bed, other than the effect that the hard bed has on screwing around with the hydrology because of the Darcy and flow in the till, uh, that's enough to switch over from where you should be using hard bed sliding laws to, to the formal bed sliding laws. But the time, so the time scale of that is basically your advection in versus your advection out. So if you have a situation where the effective stress, your velocity is probably not going to vary a ton over those spatial scales, but if your effective stress is different, say you're adjacent to some large subglacial hydraulic feature sets up, you could then screw around with the base of water pressure enough that you could basically cause some areas to lose all their till because it's quickly evicted out. And so it basically comes back to how quickly you can change sort of the regional or sub-regional scale subglacial hydrology. And then how quickly then you it takes you to eat through your, your savings of till that's occurring, which, you know, the till isn't, defect, uh, uh, the till isn't evicting over uh, or deforming over a very thick zone. And so it's going to take a while. If you have, if you're in the Laurentide and you have 50 meters of till, it's going to take thousands of years to create a hard bed situation out of that. The converse is if you have a hard bed and you only need 10 centimeters of till, you might be able to go from a hard bed to a soft bed much quicker than you can go from a soft bed to a hard bed. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the image that you show where there is a, the interface is flat, then it deepens, yeah. and then flattens again so wondering first is what will the specific that uh, control that will make that the, the deformation 
and in a in a larger scale because you say there's no upscale issues but like in a larger features in time what will be the relative contribution to the overall teal kind of deformation those such as yeah. events right so that will just scale with however big of a keel you can make and the classic idea for what controls those is that and this is kind of debated is that there's a, a section of hard beds like where the bed is not deformable to rigid bedrock and that sort of is like a mold and the ice moves over that and that puts a mold into the basal ice that gives it those keels and then that molded ice that has the keels keeps advancing and then advances into an area of deformable beds and then that mold then drags through there you know like fingers through silly putty or something like that or like play-doh and so it's the it's the presence of an upstream uh rigid bedrock which in west antarctica at least you know there's many other people in this room that are more equipped <laughs> answers than me in some areas we have that at weights we have that because we know we have this mix of hard and soft beds but in it, like other places on the Sipal Coast, that hasn't been seen as much. Like people have invoked like, it's all till, but some of the till is more stiff than others. And whether or not it's stiff enough to make these keels, maybe, maybe not, right? And so, but like those mega scale glacial lineations, like I showed in Canada, that's the leading explanation for them is that basically you have a bedrock that has some pattern, develops those big keels, and then those keels scrape scrape through the till in, in some way and carve out the, carve out the the features, yeah. That was a great talk. Um, I'm curious about maybe right at the edge of the subglacial hy hydrology, right? So where you start getting the, the larger, maybe something that's gonna become a tunnel valley or something like that. Yeah. Is there a, could you predict from these experiments some kind of shadow of influence? Like how far into the till system with the amount of evection, the you know, amount of Q, can you actually draw till to feed those? And is there, do they become self-limiting? Yeah, it's the, so the classic model for like till flux into channel, tunnel valleys is wrong because they treated the till as a viscous rheology and that's how they drive it in there. Uh, but there's new models that use discrete element method models and then look at the role of how the effective pressure diffuses into the surrounding zone. And that those work really well, actually. So yeah, it's basically a Darcy and flow problem and then once you know the distribution of water pressure, you have to somehow relate that to the advection of the till through like what we've done here. So it's just the, it's just putting those two pieces together. Um, you can do, yeah. I don't want to knock anything over. So you said that um, you wouldn't really expect the flow to scale with the ice sheet velocity. But then you saw that it did. So do you have any ideas or hypotheses why? Yep. Yeah. I think the the reason for that is is a fairly simple one, which is that it's the viscous coupling at the ice till interface. And so while the till is a pure purely cooling material, you put a viscous material on top of till, and then you start moving that. As the ice moves faster, that that ice has a viscous rheology, and that delivers stress to the underlying bed like a viscous material would and so it's it's i think it's because of the the coupling at that interface no. and we've tested that i've tested that with like some by looking at those fifteen thousand drumlins and building out a map of what the paleo flow velocities were and the cumulative displacements and then and then just figuring out how long it would have to take them with the sliding law that i made and these types of things and it, it works out like you can predict the distribution the distribution of the elongations from that yeah we have a number of questions from online. Okay. Um, we have a wonderful presentation. I was just wondering what could be responsible for the eastwards left to right motion of glaciers as shown in the presentation. I think that what they're referring to is in Canada where, they're, where they uh, looked at the ice streams that were flowing in the Laurentide and the answer is I have no idea. <laughs> they map them out. I mean, they map the elongated features going in that direction, but it must be like, in some time in the bends right there so he probably can answer better than me but like when it builds up you have local highs in the ice dome which drives for some period of time the ice flow in a, in a weird direction which is not normally going to go and that those landforms are just capturing like that sort of brief period of time when the configurations of the domes in the Laurentide is not its typical configuration with the big dome over Hudson's Bay but that that's just my guess yeah 
Okay, another question is, why did you choose the Horicon till? Were different samples of the Horicon till used in the variable grain size distribution experiments? Are there any other tills you would like to use in the ring? Uh, we chose a Horicon till because it's what's under my feet in Madison. That's the one answer. But the, actually the real answer is that before I even was at Wisconsin, I used to drive up to Madison and dig out buckets of the Horicon till because the Horicon till there's in the upper Midwest, there's a unit called the St. Peter sandstone. The St. Peter sandstone is very well sorted sandstone that's weakly cemented. And when it was eroded by the glaciers, it made a particularly sandy till. And we want to use sandy tills for at least initially in these experiments because we want to uh, increase the hydraulic permeability of the till so that we don't have big complications in the types of pore water pressure problems that uh, Damien was talking about. And so as a first order, we use this Horicon till to make things simpler. What's next is we have, I, I think I have basically all of the subglacial till samples collected from Antarctica at this point. And, and, and not, they're not big enough to put in the ring shear, right? Like most of them are like this much. And so we, we have done XRD and grain size distribution of them. And the beauty of Wisconsin is the Lake Michigan lobe made these incredibly silt rich tills and the Green Bay lobe made these incredibly sandy rich tills. And so I, in the geologic survey has mapped all of these. And so I can drive around to six different outcrops, get those tills, combine them in a specific way and replicate what's at the base of Antarctica. And that's what, that's what we're starting to do now. We have, my office just has literally hundreds of five gallon buckets of tills in it that we've collected from around the state that we're starting to put together to synthesize subglacial tills from Antarctica. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. More, more questions. Is anyone else? Yeah, there's, there's another one. Okay. Um, have you seen changes in pore water pressure in the till as lineations within the bed develop? And is the ring shear capable of changing direction of rotation during a run? Uh, the lineations is a good point because you might expect as a fabric develops in the till that that's going to affect the hydraulic permeability. And we haven't, we haven't seen it, but that, that might, you know, those small scale influences might be there. We just haven't looked that closely, mainly because we, a lot of times just jump by the time, like in Derek's question, the time by the time when those are forming and just worry about after everything's in sort of a quasi steady state configuration. And so that's what we've done in previously, but now we're not doing that. Now we're cyclically, continually cyclically oscillating the system. And so we have to worry about all, all those types of things. Um, uh, the, what was the second question? Um, can you reverse the direction? Oh, we can. We don't ever do it, but, but, but we could, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what it would mimic in nature. Yeah, the interesting thing with this system is it's so big and the gearbox is so, you know, it's got so many components. That with any gearbox, when you start spinning it, you have to take the slack out of the system, right? You have to wind it up and that tensions all the gears. And, and so if you drive this way, you've already preconditioned the system and taken the tension. And then if you want to go the other way, you basically got to reverse it and do the whole thing in the opposite direction. And so there's this period where when you switch directions, that the system just basically, the motors and the gears and driving the, driving the upper platen just basically doesn't respond because it's got to back its way back out of the system. I don't know what, it, yeah, I don't know exactly why we would do it, but we could do it, yeah. I have one more. Um, have you ever done any runs with a frozen base like permafrost? Not intentionally, yeah. So uh, we, you know, I, I, the, what happens is the, the till is when it's water saturated and not frozen, if you look at the yield strength of it, is way less than the, the stress that's imparted on the ice. So. The, so the ice doesn't deform much at all. And most of the deformations in the till. If we froze the till, um, what would happen is the yield stress of it would become higher than the ice probably. And, and it would have to like physically break somewhere. Now we've done this other study to look, okay, so this is a bit of an aside, but we, one thing I work on is trying to understand how coastal processes occur and how ice affects coastal processes. And if you've ever been to a beach in the winter, what happens first is the, the beach freezes with, with sand, with the beach fan, sand freezes, and then an ice complex builds up from the front. When waves hit that frozen sand, 
Sometimes they can rip off blocks of ice, and those blocks of ice that have a bunch of sediment can float out into deep water. In the Great Lakes and in Arctic environments, that's maybe the leading order deficit in the sediment budget. And so we wanted to figure out how you could rip frozen blocks of debris-laden ice away from beaches. And so we froze the ice, and then we froze the sediment in the ice to the block. Allie helped with this. And then we spun the ring shear and we ripped it away. And we are trying to figure out, is it a viscous response? Is it a Coulomb response? How should we treat the ability for waves to, to rip away shore fast ice? And then what is the strength dependent on? And then we, we built, hit it with a wave model to figure out how big the waves have to be. So we've done it in that context, but not for permafrost. It's for coast, it's kind of for like coastal geomorphology in places that get cold. All right, well, we're over time. So thanks so much for taking so many questions and being our first speaker of the seminar of the series. Thanks.